Steve, tell us a little bit more about HealthNet Connect and, and the overlap about how your view or approach uh, to big data is evolving. Well, first, I'd like to thank Cavendish for the opportunity and privilege to speak at to this illustrious group on a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. I'd also like to thank my wife, who's pregnant and taking care of our 18-month-old, for allowing me to come to Oxford. Thank you, Samantha. <laughs> Did you get that? OK, thanks. <laughs> Big data is like fuel. It is like oil in the ground. Once you take it out and refine it, it amplifies its usefulness and its value. That came from Stephen Gold, not Churchill, just for the record. <laughs> the, the old paradigm for healthcare is detect and respond. The new paradigm for healthcare using big, big data is anticipate and prevent. Wanted to first start with defining what big data is because as the term has come to mean a lot of different things in the healthcare space. Healthcare produces large amounts of clinical, financial, administrative, and genomic information. They're often referred to as the four V's as far as big data. Volume, which is the amount of information. Variety, which is the type and different sources of information. Velocity, which is the speed of information coming in and out of the system. And of course, veracity, how, how well you trust in the quality of the information. Within the digital health uh, industry, big data refers to scientific techniques capturing and analyzing huge and complex data sets in a way to positively impact patient outcomes and business processes. Big data often refers to analyzing large amounts of data, but it also can refer to storing large amounts of data. And by using this big data, we hope to achieve better clinical outcomes. From banking to retail, many sectors have embraced big data. For example, grocery stores have customer loyalty programs, and the use of inf this information helps identify sales trends, optimize product mix, and develop special offers. These types of programs improve profits and also help improve customer satisfaction. So how can we better organize, understand, and use large amounts of data to improve uh, the delivery of care? How can we make providers and patients more efficient and allow them to make more informed decisions on patient health? Big data can not only help to increase people's life expectancy, but their quality of life. Big data in healthcare comes from many different sources. Social media, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn are incredible sources of healthcare data. The CDC is now using social media as their primary source to preposition flu vaccine around the United States. It's amazing how far social media has come. Machine to machine data, you talked about sensors. Um, companies like AT&T and Apple are using smart home uh, projects to try to get as much data and information from people in the homes. For example, their furnace, their TV, um, blood pressure. Aging in place, the Internet of Things are going to become common terms in healthcare. There's transaction data that you were talking about, claims and billing information, both in structured and unstructured uh, ways. One of the challenges with claims data, it's very unstructured. 80% of our data on healthcare is unstructured. But the more data is refined, the more valuable it is. Biometric data, we're now using fingerprints, genomics, handwriting, retinal scans, and recently I saw facial recognition being used in healthcare. Um, Human-generated data, electronic medical records and physician notes are part of the human-generated data. In the U.S., they mandated electronic medical records. This has had an unintended consequence. Even though we have greater access to data, efficiency has dropped dramatically. Some people say 30 to 40 percent because doctors can't see as many patients. So we're going to have to figure out ways uh, to work smarter, not harder. And then, of course, the pharmaceutical information from drug mechanics, side effects, different genomics testing. Now genomics testing is being used before giving expensive drugs just to ensure that the drugs are actually absorbed within uh, per particular patients. So there's lots and lots of data out there. Industry sh trends show that big data is growing tremendously. r, &R research says that it's growing 23% uh, percent annually, and that'll be a $10.8 billion industry by 2017. 
McKinsey estimates that we use the, if we use the, the potential of big data to save us money, we could, in the U.S., we could save three to $450 billion annually. How do we get there? What are the keys for success in utilizing big data? Well, the first thing, I believe, is to paint a picture. Big data is way too numeric, it's way too complicated. 80% of people learn best by seeing pictures. Data needs to be packaged in a way that people can understand. People are going to have to take more responsibility for their health care, and they're going to have, the only way they're going to be able to do this is to get relevant data in a way that they can understand it. The other thing that's going to be important is understanding variation. Deming advocated for the elimination of all unnecessary variation in processes. There is non-value added variation that harms process and organization. This variation needs to be rooted out. Then there is variation that is value added and needed in order to foster innovation. So, for example, congestive heart failure is a big reason why we have readmissions in the United States. It costs $440 billion to the healthcare system. So Ascension, which I'm on the board of in Michigan, we, we followed all the particular post-acute discharge strategies, home care, transitions of care, um, all the different guidelines put out by the, by the American Heart Association, and we had no difference, no improvement in, in readmissions. But when they added telemedicine to help fill in the clinical gaps in the continuum of care, they were able to drop readmissions down 72%. So we can have a plan, but we always have to foster innovation and support that. And the last thing, what Dr. Smith was talking about today at lunch, is overcoming these interoperability type of challenges. Um, the top 10 ele uh, electronic medical record companies in the United States have 90% of the marketplace. None of the systems are able to talk. So the ability to pull data from disparate systems is, is very challenging. Um, some of the reasons for, for this lack of interoperability include liability, privacy, security, regulatory, and intellectual property issues. So it's not a clear cut, just wave a magic wand and everything connects. There are a lot of challenges that have to be taken care of. We need not, we need not only to better coordinate the sharing of data, not just across different IT platforms, but different populations around the world. Martin Luther King once said, we all come on different ships, but currently we're all in the same boat. 25 years ago, yesterday, the Berlin Wall was torn down. Ronald Reagan boldly said to Mikhail Gorbachev, tear down that wall. Well, in healthcare, we have to tear down those walls if we're going to optimize what we're doing and, and best, um, best manage our finite resources. Whoever can leverage data-driven strategies to innovate and capture value will have a tremendous advantage in this new digital health world. Thank you. Um, a question that I had is, with the onset of digital health, mobile health, whatever you want to call it, um, and all of this new data coming in, and specifically from patients who are now empowered with these devices, what I've seen is, is almost a leapfrogging, where the patient actually has more data than the doctor knows what to do with. So how are we going to, or, or what are your thoughts with regards to primary care physicians who have all these different diseases and all these different things that they have to worry about, and they can't really be an expert in, in any of them, specifically with chronic diseases? Um, so how can we, or, or what are your thoughts with regards to all this data is coming in, but if the doctor doesn't even understand the disease enough to know what to do with that data, how is that going to change, or, or what can we do to kind of make that change in the future? 40% of patients do not go see their physician within a 12-month period. So over 90% of healthcare happens outside of the hospital, happens outside of the doctor's office. It happens in the home. So I, I, I think, you know, the ability to get that type of information and, and aggregate in different ways is one thing. I think another critical element is tying in the incentives so that doctors have an incentive to do this. So um, right now in the U.S. there's not really a mechanism to do it. We are working with several self-insured companies, and in, in that model, uh, there's a care, a, a care manager, or a, healthcare, um, a healthcare champion within the doctor's office, usually a nurse or a PA, and they're taking a subset of folks every single day, and they say red, yellow, green. It's got to be something very simple, 
uh, to your point, data is way too numeric. And so if you can, you know, kind of red flag those folks, and there is a mechanism where for doing these virtual visits, you could actually uh, get some sort of reimbursement incentive. And that's where under this population health environment things are going. So we did a particular project with the United Auto Workers and General Motors on diabetes where they could actually get paid for a virtual visit. And there was a mechanism to do it through Anthem, Michigan Blue Cross Blue Shield, and the UAW Retiree Medical Benefit Trust. So I think the incentives are a critical element along with making the data more, more uh, you know, uh, I guess real. Well, and understandable action. Sure. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you all. Uh, we heard about inter interoperability at lunch and then about breaking down the walls just now uh, and an explosion of data as self-monitoring, at-home monitoring, et cetera. But we have one of the walls being HIPAA compliance, this interoperability, I mean, a third of doctors' time being spent entering data. Do you see that uh, being addressed in some, in some manner? Because um, HIPAA compliance, the ability to electronically enter data, is a critical component of how we actually start to, to energize all the, uh, the pieces in, in terms of med, med tech that are starting to emerge to make things more efficient. I'm just curious uh, how you might respond to that. In the smart home model, what the, you know, like the companies like AT&T and Apple, you know, if you, they're, they're getting waivers for HIPAA as well. That's another strategy. Something I don't know how far that's gonna go or the legalities of it. Uh, actually, it's Rather than question, I just wanted to share one uh, thing. So I was in the Mishbio and the expo in the, like last month, and there uh, FDA, FDA Chandler was there, and she was talking about the FDA process. And one of the things that she mentioned was custom, like driven, citizen driven medicine. So they were, they were thinking about the possibility how we can include them as a HIPAA uh, related or IRB related process they want to incorporate in the process. Can I just say something about the FDA process is that now also with telemedicine technologies out there, you're not going to need as big of a population to do these studies because compliance in these studies and gathering data is challenging. Sometimes I know people drive hours just to participate in these studies. And I, I think, you know, using new technologies, I think you're going to be able to get the amount of data that you need to make the FDA and whoever else powers that be more comfortable that, you know, the data and information you have, you know, is, is you know, is, is where it needs to be and stuff. So I think technology is going to impact that process as well.